Something's wrong with that kid. His head don't work, it never did. You better not cross his path. He's a chain smoking alcoholic sociopath. Mr. Franklin, the prison psychiatrist, was running out of ideas how to treat Kevin's sociopathic tendencies. Kevin, I normally don't like to take this option, but everything else has failed. I'm going to recommend a strict regimen of powerful medication. Kevin liked the idea of powerful medication because he was always happy to try new drugs. And if the government wanted to foot the bill, Kevin wasn't about to argue. The guards took him to a room he'd never been in before and placed him in restraints. Take two of these pills. They're very powerful and may cause some slight side effects. But they should break down your inhibition and get past your hostility. Kevin took the pills. And after a few minutes, he started to feel them take effect. Something was strange. It was a whole lot different from the codeine lithium buzz he'd grown to appreciate. This was something new. What are you feeling, Kevin? Kevin began to hallucinate and got a little bit lost in his own head. He ran into his imaginary friend, Alan the Magic Goose, but something was different about him. I don't feel like playing today, Kevin. Just have a nap. Kevin tried to convince Alan that he needed his help. Would you do any good rest, Kevin? <laughs> then Kevin's mind filled with all sorts of bizarre memories, like the time he fell through the seat in the outhouse. Or the time Pete Wilcox thought he was Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm the king of the world! Kevin didn't much like the idea of confronting his issues and memories without Alan's help, and he was a little bit scared because he figured he might be having a bad trip. But then again, thinking about his childhood was a lot like having a bad trip. So he wasn't really sure if it was the drugs or not. The prison where Kevin was being incarcerated was one of the toughest in the country. There were gangs everywhere. The Aryan Brotherhood, Mexican Mafia, and the most dangerous of all, the former Hollywood child actors. Look, if I don't get the same cell Christian Slater had, your days as my agent are over. Kevin was pretty scared, so he decided to try and stay out of trouble. Mostly because he worked the prison black market with all these people, and he didn't want to lose any of his customers. Life on the inside was a different world, with its own rules and even its own language. Both mules humping tally water. Best be grade A, or he's gonna get punked in the covered wagon for sure. Can you show me this covered wagon everyone keeps talking about? I'm new in here. Sure. One day, Kevin was in the TV room watching Prisoner Access Cable. Normally, he didn't like watching TV shows, but today was different. It's time for Prisoner Access TV, a show by inmates for inmates. 30 minutes of entertainment, but you only have to sit through 25 with good behavior. <laughs> Welcome back. Don't forget, your intestine starts tomorrow, so be sure and buy yours early. We're back with Frank Fry, the fish man of Folsom. Frank, you say you've been raising these piranha fish in your toilet. Sure did, Joe. That's how I lost this arm. <laughs> You're a brave man. <laughs> Think that's brave? <laughs> Try wiping your arse with a hook. <laughs> Thanks for being with us, Frank. Y your parents must be proud. I wouldn't know. My dad was a pilot who died in his sleep. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> Not as sorry as his passengers. <laughs> our next guest is a regular on our show because he's a three-time loser. You may know him as number 38492, but he'll always be number one with us. Percy Spencer. Hey, Percy. Hey, Joe. 
Percy, what'd you get busted for this time? Yeah, without thigh after my curfew. They put you in prison for that? And they call that justice? Yeah, without thigh after my curfew. And inside a liquor store after it closed. <laughs> <laughs> Percy, I understand you're gonna show us a talent. Yeah, I'm gonna burp popular thongs. <laughs> Everyone in the TV room laughed as Percy burped out the song. Kevin would have laughed too, but because he was a sociopath, he could only tap his foot to the music. And that was only because he saw other people doing it, and he wanted to fit in. Percy, that was great. I'd applaud if I wasn't handcuffed. Maybe we'll see you next time if you can't avoid those crafty pigs. <laughs> wasn't the cops that caught me. My effing boy turned me in. You mean your son ratted you out? Sure did. Hey, wait a minute. That makes him a stoolie. Stoolie is the dirtiest word in the prisoner's vocabulary. And now that his fat ass old man had spilled the beans, Kevin would have to spend all his time watching his back. For the next few days, Kevin's life was pretty miserable. Hey, Spencer, you're a dead man, a dead man! Yeah, you stool pigeon, oink, oink, oink. That's a pig, you dumbass. Really? What the hell's a pigeon sound like? It makes like this, uh, coo, coo, coo sound or something. Kevin didn't much like the idea of having to put up with this. He wasn't afraid of the other inmates, but his new reputation was hurting his black market business. We don't do business with no stoolies, gringo. Yeah, from now on we're dealing with the serial killers. At least they have some principles, man. Kevin had to figure something out right quick, or he'd end up broke, or worse. Clean urine for sale. Guaranteed negative test results. Kevin told Pete about his problem. Pete thought that Kevin was the messiah and had always acted as his bodyguard and tried to help him out. I wish I could help you, God, but I can't take on the whole prison. Things weren't looking too good for Kevin, and it was only a matter of time before all the other prisoners decided to straighten him out. All right, Spencer, it's payback time. Yeah, when we're through with you, your own parents won't recognize you. Suddenly, the prison siren went off, and the guards marched everyone into the dining area for a speech from the warden. Where's Kevin Spencer? Spencer, because you're the only one who's urine tested negative for drugs, you've been given early parole as an example to the population. Congratulations, boy, you're a free man. Kevin was saved. Pete had spiked everyone's urine with drugs. Everyone except Kevin. <sighs> my God, I've seen some fine urine in my 20 years, but this, smell the bouquet. That night, all the other prisoners except Kevin were in the TV room. They were all pretty upset at having an extra few months tacked onto their sentences because of the positive drug test, and they were looking for someone to take it out on. Hey, come to think of it, we wouldn't have been after Kevin if this old man hadn't picked him out on that TV show. Yeah, that means Percy's a stoolie. Get him! He'll be able to mule a Buick after we get done with him in the covered wagon. Don't believe that, mister. <laughs> you need me in your covered wagon. Percy Spencer was up to his ass in trouble with the law again because he'd gotten into another car accident. It was a head-on collision. The police suspected that alcohol was involved, mostly because the other car was still in the showroom and Percy had been driving a speedboat he'd stolen from a nearby lake. Mr. Spencer, it seems that, besides being an unrepentant substance abuser, you are also chronically unemployed. If you can complete an employment seminar, I'll reduce your sentence to time served in the hopes that you may someday find an honest job. 
it occurred to Percy that doing time in a job seminar was probably a whole lot easier than doing it in the joint. And he was also a lot less likely to get sodomized over a pack of smokes. Mr. Spencer, you're three days late. Well, normally I wouldn't come till next week, but I thought I'd make a good impression. I guess I can fit you in today's class, but what in the name of God are you wearing? The parole officer told me to dress nice so I'd make a good impression. You looking for some private lessons? Sit down, you fat reprobate. The modern workforce has to be increasingly conscious of the effect of economic globalization and the trend towards international trade agreements and their impact on a job market increasingly reliant on technology. First, Percy tried to understand what the woman was talking about. Then he tried to imagine what she'd look like giving her speech in fishnet stockings with a French maid's outfit. Oh, Percy, you're so manly. Say something romantic. I'll sign over my welfare check if you let me do it with you. And through this networking strategy, your job search should succeed. Are there any questions? Yeah. Are you a screamer, you know, in the sack? Perhaps we'll move on to our skills training. Yeah, like you ain't been thinking about it. The most useful talent you can have today is computer skills. I want each of you to try out the software and see if you can compose a winning resume. Very good. Good going, Marty. I would hire you, Walter. Mr. Spencer. Mr. Spencer, you're looking at pornography. Yeah, computers are great. I don't think you're fully appreciating the DNA evidence. Maybe it would help if you showed us another sample. I got the sample right here, baby. Being a juror sure is hot work. Would anyone mind if I took off my pants? I got something I'd like to enter into evidence. But our computers aren't hooked up to the internet. Most aren't. That's why I always bring some with me. This is our practice interview. I'll pretend to be a prospective employer, and I will ask you questions that you might expect in a typical job interview. Miss Dispenser, why would you like to work for this company? Booth and whores ain't cheap. That's fine, but I need to know what kind of skills you can offer. I can do it all night long. Mr. Spencer, does everything have to revolve around sex? Sex? I was talking about drinking. <laughs> I'm happy to say you all graduated. Mr. Spencer, I was going to fail you, but then I realized that the court would probably just send you back here. So, you get a passing grade as well. Hot damn! I'll miss you, lady. But I guess it was never meant to be. Yes, just remember, when they ask you what position you want, do not write doggy style. Two weeks later, the judge from Percy's trial was walking down the street when Percy ran up to him. Hey, judge, just wanted you to know I took your advice. I got a job. That's good to hear, Spencer. I'm proud to know I had something to do with putting your life on track. So what are you doing these days? I work for Louis the Loan Shark, the guy you've been stiffing for 20 grand worth of poker money for the last month. Oh, um, you work for Louis now, huh? Oh, well, um, if you could just give me till Friday. Percy gave the judge one damn holy ass whooping and took his money, credit cards, and BMW. On the drive back to Louis's house, Percy got to thinking maybe the judge was right. Doing an honest day's work sure had a way of making a man feel good about himself. <laughs> then he got to thinking about the time he went to the carnival and saw some stunt drivers driving their cars on two wheels. For the most part, Percy would have done a lot better in life if he'd just not bothered thinking about things. Kevin was undergoing a series of treatments with a new medication that Mr. Franklin was certain would help him become a useful member of society again. Mr. Franklin, we understand that you've been using a particular medication from our military surplus pharmaceutical department. Yes, 
Oh, not only that, they gave me these cool camouflage pants. I'm the hit of the nightclubs, thanks to you. Those are army pants, Mr. Franklin. The Navy does not use camouflage. Really? My point is, I'm afraid I'm going to have to order you to cease your use of this medication. But... But I can't do that. For the first time, I've been able to break down Kevin Spencer's emotional resistance. We might actually have a chance of making him a valuable member of society again. Yes, we in the military also like helping society. But I am afraid the pills have turned out to have some rather unfortunate side effects. I might say terrifying, but that would be a breach of security. Uh, terrifying side effects? Uh, but you have to tell me. This is my patient we're talking about. Well, it is breaking security, slapping the flag and the Constitution in the face. But when you look at me with those sad puppy dog eyes, how can I say no? The pills cause drowsiness, sleepiness, loss of appetite, emotional fatigue, anxiety attacks, injured unborn fetuses, sinus headache. But these are all common side effects. If we can treat any of them right here in the hospital. And the psychic power to move objects with the mind. What? Oh my goodness! We have to get to the treatment room immediately! Mr. Franklin and the General rushed into the treatment room, but it was too late. Uh-oh. It wasn't the first time Kevin had had trouble with the penal system because of his involvement with drugs. <laughs> Mr. Franklin thought about one of the other times while Kevin flew him around the room like a kite and banged him into some walls. As part of his community service, Kevin had to do volunteer work at the animal shelter. Kevin liked working with animals, especially the part where he got to gas the extra puppies. Unfortunately, the animal shelter gas bill was getting too high, so Kevin had to back over them with a car instead. Now get the hell out of my car, Spencer, you useless pea brain tool! I need you to take this package to the branch over on the west side. As Kevin walked to the bus stop, he got curious about what was inside the package. It was filled with syringes and veterinary medications. Kevin got really excited. Syringes and medications were in high demand in prison, and Kevin figured if he could find a way to sneak them to his friends in the joint, he'd be looking at a nice chunk of change. As plans go, Kevin figured this was a real good one. To avoid suspicion, Kevin put something else in the package and delivered it to the other branch as expected. All right, it's that barking Christmas dog CD. Now Kevin had to figure out how to get all these drug supplies into the joint. But the only person with any experience as a mule was his mom, so he decided to ask her. Usually when I smuggle smokes to the old man, I hide them in my body cavities. I was the only guy who got a whole carton smuggled in. <laughs> Kevin didn't want his parents to know about his plan because they'd want a cut of the action. So he told them that it was part of a homework assignment. I know a pig on the inside who smuggles stuff in for a cut. Maybe he'll help you with your homework. Kevin thought that was a good idea, since even he was smart enough to know that syringes and body cavities didn't go together so well. Kevin went to the prison guard's house and told him the scam. If he brought the stuff in, he'd get 25%. I take the risks and you get the money? No way. It's 50-50. Because Kevin had never done too well in math, he didn't really know the difference between 25% and 50% anyway. He just figured any money was better than no money and handed over the package. The guard took the drugs and needles into the prison and collected all the money. Then he decided to get greedy and stiff Kevin out of his cut. This is all the money he gave me. Now you want to make something out of it? Maybe I should call your probation officer and tell him about your little scam. Kevin was stumped. He knew Pete had given the guard more money than that. He thought maybe his imaginary friend Alan could help him. You ain't gotta take that, boy. Learn that pig a thing or two. Alan sure did make a lot of sense, leastwise if you were a sociopath like Kevin. 
Kevin told the guard he wasn't going to leave until they talked the matter through and came to a satisfactory resolution. It was a social strategy he saw once on the Partridge family. Stay as long as you want. Ain't going to change nothing. Since the first idea wasn't working, Kevin whipped out a knife and sliced off the guard's ear, then took his money, his keys, his credit cards, and one of the uniforms from his closet. Kevin figured that ought to straighten things out. Then he got the old man to put on the uniform and go unlock the south gate of the prison. It was the biggest escape in the prison's history. The only one who didn't get away was Kevin, because he was so jacked up on rum that he passed out while going through some of the escaped convict cells looking for porn magazines. The police just left him in the cell to await trial for robbery, assault, <laughs> and aiding and abetting a fugitive. That's the kind of thing that would bother most people. But since Kevin wasn't capable of feeling emotion, and since he spent most days just sitting around smoking, drinking, and talking to his imaginary friend Alan the Magic Goose, he didn't much give a damn either way. That's one of the nice things about being insane. Mr. Franklin had decided to try chemical medication to eliminate Kevin's sociopathic tendencies. The pills were experimental, and they gave Kevin the psychic power of moving things with his mind. Kevin sure did like having supernatural powers, because he could destroy things without a lot of heavy lifting. He floated through the hospital throwing large objects at the guards and wrecking anything that looked expensive. General, there must be something we can do to stop this mayhem. It's only a theory, but if we can figure out a way to overload his brain, we can short circuit him. In order to do it, we'll need a question. A diabolically ingenious problem. I've got it. Oh, Kevin, where's Waldo? Kevin's brain churned furiously trying to solve this complicated puzzle, but eventually it was no use. He overloaded and dropped to the floor unconscious. We did it! Now, in keeping with government policy, I'm afraid we're gonna have to kill you all to conceal the evidence. Oh, there you go with the eyes again. Listen, just promise me you won't tell anyone and we'll forget this whole incident ever happened. Mr. Franklin figured he'd stick to the more humanitarian forms of treatment, like electroshock. <laughs> 